Hello and welcome to Spy Hard's podcast where your hosts go deep undercover into the world of spy movies to decipher which films make the knock list. But remember, this information is strictly for your ears only. I'm Agent Scott. And I'm Cam the Provocateur. And Scott, you're bloody well not sleeping here. Uh, why would I want to? Uh, you've just got this uh, porcelain bulldog staring at me the whole time. <laughs> true, true. I'm, wait- I'm waiting for it to start winking at me like the fish. um now we've got a very special film a special film to me to tackle this week um but it's special to a lot of people and i thought i'd bring in a very special agent to join us um coming in onto silver's rat infested island along with us this week it is voiceover artist and documentarian extraordinaire friend of the show catherine vinclair how are you doing hi guys i'm good how are you Living the dream. Wonderful. Yeah, living the dream. Living the dream. We get to talk about uh, spy films every week. I can't complain. But um, before we get into this week's film, let's get to know you a little bit better. Now, uh, we've shared a drink in in public. We've been seen together in public, which is a rare thing for me. It has Um, been known. It has been known. But uh, for everyone else, let's fill in the brief. Now, you're a voiceover artist, which is a fascinating job. Yeah. Um. How did that happen? How did you get into it? Well, I came from the opposite side of the creative spectrum, really. I was a camera operator for several years before wanting something new. And I thought, well, if I want to get back into the creative industry, what would I like to do? And I thought, well, I don't know much about audio. So I thought, let's just learn and get educated. I bought a microphone. I started playing around with ideas of audio production and editing and everything else. I'm sure you guys have had to learn everything that I've had to go through as well for your podcast. And then I thought, well, I keep seeing this word voiceover artist and thinking, well, that's something that sounds quite fun. So I thought, let's just give it a go. And I think I've just been very fortunate. I've been able to find work and have a brilliant, brilliant career um, in the years since. I've been very lucky. I mean, one thing listeners will probably notice is your very unique voice, which I think is probably a very good and key skill you've got when it comes to voiceover work. Uh, And how, I mean, I I suppose the information is out there, but, you know, your voice is, as I say, very unique. How did that come to pass? I've literally always sounded like this. I've done nothing to deserve this voice, frankly. Wow. Um, I was born with vocal paralysis. So one of my vocal cords is paralyzed. So the vestibular folds, the little muscles um, that live just below your vocal cords uh, have been doing all the work for me because my vocal cords just don't move. So it gives me this this kind of raspy vibe to my voice, which I've just learned to work with within my line of, of profession. Well, you play to your strengths. And I'd say it's definitely a strength because... You know, looking at the work you've done so far, you've been bouncing from uh, job to job, strength to strength so far. It's like it's endless. You're doing everything. You're like the busiest voiceover artist I know. (laughs) How many voiceover artists do you know? Two. Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) No, but thank you very much. The, 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 The diversity of the industry is part of why I love it so much. I can be doing a... Uh, a crazy video game character one day and a sort of upper class sedate lady in waiting in an audio book the next so it's uh you really run the gauntlet in terms of discovering what your voice can do hmm. and what are some roles that you're particularly proud of do you know i think it's got to be this collection of roles that I did for a Warhammer game last year. Because normally when you get pulled onto a project, you are asked to voice one character, maybe two. But for this, I did 25 different characters (laughs) of different races, different genders, different backgrounds. And it was just the most fun you can imagine. Uh, We did them all in one go, where you're just going from line to line to line, character to character to character. Um, And whilst there will probably be one single role that encapsulates my whole career in the future, for the time being, it's just those opportunities where I get to do all sorts in one go. That's always really refreshing to me. 
well, this is a, a perfect time to announce that actually from this point onwards, the rest of the show will be voiced strictly by you doing all three parts. <laughs> yes, I'm just a solid mimic. <laughs> yeah, it's it's fantastic. Yeah, it hasn't been us the whole time. Uh, we've been on holiday this whole time. Exactly. It's fantastic. Yeah. Nobody knows. <laughs> um, now, the other thing I find fascinating, I was doing my research on you earlier, is... And you mentioned about you're working in, in film uh, behind the lens with a camera. You went to film school. Like you studied film professionally. Yes. Yes. I have a degree in film production and cinematography. And it's lovely that you'd bring that up because no one really brings their degrees up. It's nice. Yeah. It was a long time ago now, but I, I, I just loved the opportunity to do exactly what we're going to do now. Analyze films, talk about films, discuss what makes them work. Um, cinema's always been a huge passion of mine, so it's just been lovely to study it and then work in it as well. And I suppose the last question before we sort of segue into this week's film and, and the reason you've joined us, and the one thing we I think we discussed when we were at the pub was a shared love of not only James Bond, because we met during a, a showing of License to Kill, I believe it was, uh, last yes. year. So yeah, we've, we've shared a Bond film already together. But um, just a love of, firstly, of Star Trek. So I'll always tip my hat to you for for being a Star Trek fan. Hmm. Of course. Yes, there's nothing finer. Quite right. Uh, But also just, uh, you know, film and spy movies as as sort of a general topic. So uh, taking that into context, what are sort of some of your favorite spy movies? I'm actually a big fan of both versions of the Thomas Crown Affair. I think the, the, the differences between them are so stark but i love them both they're two completely different beasts but i'm i'm such a fan of um of well for one the soundtrack to both is actually really exquisite um i think the original thomas crown affair just can't be beat it's iconic um the atmosphere the darkness i i i really appreciate it when spy films can somehow bring the reality of espionage, which which is terrifying, and the cinematic idea of espionage, which is sexy and a bit glamorous and a bit cool. Um, I think I think the best films really can blend those two things together. So, like Condor Man. <laughs> yeah. uh, maybe maybe not Condor Man, Cam. <laughs> but, uh, but that does that does lead me to one final question. You 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 do the voiceover roles. You do them fantastically. You love spy movies. Is there a role you'd love to play in a spy movie? Money Penny. Oh, okay. A thousand times Money Penny. I used to I used to dress up as Money Penny when I was a little girl. I had these Harry Potter glasses because obviously to go with the gown. And um, I used to yeah I used to put on the glasses and pretend to type. This was before I'd learned how to type. I was just a kid. And yeah, and I just pretend that I was waiting for Bond, and he never came. <laughs> That's so sad. <laughs> yeah, he's definitely not here now either. No. <laughs> oh, one day, one day he'll throw my hat. He'll throw his hat at me, and it'll just be the best. No, I, I love Money Penny. I think she's she's just wonderful. Her, her dynamic with Bond, for me, outdoes anything that any Bond girl has has achieved, and that's including Vesper. And uh, this. Makes this week's movie a perfect choice to have you on for then, because uh, Monty Penny does play a somewhat significant role. Just a bit. Some could argue she is the Bond girl of the film. Judy Dench would disagree with you. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's out. We'll get into that. We'll get into that, Cam. Calm down. <laughs> but it's time to think on our sins. Cam, what are we talking about this week? Yes, Scott, this is a big one. We are talking about 2012's Skyfall. Because oh no, the singing's come back. That's right. It's time to celebrate the 50th anniversary Bond film. Yeah, I've been looking forward to this one for a while. And speaking of big ones, we've got a couple of interviews this week sort of joining on the Skyfall and James Bond celebration. I'll announce one now and I'll keep one a secret to the end of the show. Joining us this week on Friday, we have Dr. Hall himself, Mr. Nicholas Wooderson, the uh, psychiatrist from the scene analysing James Bond's response to the Skyfall question. It's a fascinating interview to so look forward to that on Friday. The man has a very extensive spy resume as well, along with things like The Avengers, Russia House, The Man Who Knew Too Little. Uh, quite the adventure, so check that out on Friday. Definitely. 
And I think I'll save introducing the second interview for later in the show. But Cam, you mentioned this is a big one. And you're right. This is a very big one, not just for the world, not just for James Bond box offices, which we'll get onto in a bit. But it was big for the United Kingdom. It came at such an important and critical time. You know, we just had the Olympics. You had James Bond jumping out of a helicopter with the Queen. Uh, what a bizarre situation we were in. It felt like they were really capturing lightning in a bottle when it came to Skyfall. And I think it shows when it comes to the reception. But I think before we dig into that and the behind the scenes, here is your letterbox.com synopsis. And I warn you, this one has a dot 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 more. So uh, it's quite a read. Settle in. Okay. I just can't wait till the Spectre uh, synopsis because I'm sure that one's going to be long. It's it's probably like three lines or so. It's probably just watch the intro and turn it off. <laughs> and there's probably like a lot of crossing out because of all the rewrites on that one. <laughs> and it's tinted yellow, so you can't see it really. <laughs> Multiple versions. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Skyfall. Think on your sins. When Bond's latest assignment goes gravely wrong and agents around the world are exposed, MI6 is attacked, forcing M to relocate the agency. These events cause her authority and position to be challenged by Gareth Mallory, the new chairman of the Intelligence and Security Committee. With MI6 now compromised both inside and out, M is left with one ally she can trust, Bond, 007. He takes to the shadows, aided by only field agent Eve, following a trail to the mysterious Silver, whose lethal and hidden motives have yet to reveal themselves. And breathe! <sighs> I think what's really interesting about that synopsis is that it's written almost entirely about M. And it's not until towards the end they even mention James Bond. Uh, it definitely, I think, marks a shift in what Bond movies would do with their stories, because that's not the case with the past. Well, the first two are really much like the, the beginnings of a burgeoning spy. And then there's obviously a bit of a jump here, which I want to tackle. But let's talk about our first experiences with the film. Catherine, do you recall back in 2012 when this came out to a rather large fanfare? Yes, absolutely. I remember going to see it at the cinema. I remember watching it when I was at uni with a load of film students and them being all film critique about it and me just wanting to love the Bond experience and not think about it too much. I just want to get sucked into that world. And where had you sort of found yourself with this new era of of Bond with Daniel Craig? Because you're obviously a fan of Bond growing up, very different kind of Bond in those days. What did you think of Daniel Craig? It took me a while to warm to him, to be honest. A Casino Royale is an amazing film and I really loved his performance and that won me over. But I remember when I first, when they first introduced him as Bond and he was he was going over the Thames uh, in a speedboat with a with the life jacket on. Do you remember? <laughs> yep. How yep. horrific that was. Um, and he had the blonde hair and the blue eyes. And I thought this guy looks like a villain. He's got more 006 Goldeneye vibes than Bond vibes. So it took me a while. But then the direction that they allowed Bond to go in in the in the Craig era, I think, has been really fascinating to watch. And Skyfall, I think, was one of the more poetic musings on on Craig's whole oeuvre. Well, it felt like the first time they were actually trying to really examine the character of Bond. And obviously, we got that with the previous two. But those were more origin stories. So to have it more in a kind of middle of the road, not in terms of quality, but just in terms of like a Bond adventure story to be delving into the character, that's not something you typically got in, say, the Roger Moore era, for example. No, you just get an eyebrow and a wink and a smile and you're happy. That's right. I think for me, I, I think I was sort of caught up in the fanfare of what was going on around the time. Because as I mentioned, this was all tied into the Olympics. We'd seen James Bond pick up the Queen, jump into a helicopter and dive into the Olympic Park on, on television. I think millions of people around the world watching. And that was a very special moment, I think, for a lot of British people and people watching around the world. It was an acknowledgement that James Bond is a British staple and we're proud of James Bond and I think we should be proud of the creation of Bond 
And I think there was just a lot of marketing going into this, like 50 years of Bond and uh, just a celebratory nature of this film. And I think I think I saw this the most amount of times on release than I've ever seen a Bond film. I think I saw it about five times. Wow. Was wow. that all at the cinema? Yeah, yeah. I've seen it many times since, but all at the cinema on initial release, I've seen Skyfall five times. And I've seen it since on re-release. Brilliant. Or, or insanity, either way. <laughs> <laughs> But, but Cam, like across the pond, what was the vibe going into Skyfall in 2012? So, yeah, because we just, you know, recently had the 60th anniversary where it was a massive deal in the UK. And I was incredibly envious uh, hearing, Scott, all of the events you were going to over here. We got like a clip package at the Oscars. And uh, I mean, obviously, No Time to Die came out, but, you know, and we got the Sound of 007 documentary, but it was not the big splashy event that it was over there. Um, and that was kind of the case with the 50th. Um, they did, to their credit, to Eon's credit, very much market Skyfall as the 50th anniversary, which I do think had some impact. You obviously had the 50th logo showing up in the movie. Um, so, yeah, people were, I think, somewhat aware, but it just wasn't like the big, probably, event it was over there. Um, and uh, for me, I'll never forget the night I saw Skyfall. It was... <laughs> or the night before, I should add, because I, um, or was it the, yeah, that's right. Um, so typically around this point in my life, when there was big movies coming out, say it's a Marvel movie, a Bond movie, whatever. You went we by would, yourself because you were so lonely. Exactly. And I would weep into my hands when it was over. And then I would write a diary about the experience. <laughs> no, what had happened was I, um, would gather a bunch of friends. I would buy all the tickets basically myself and then everyone would pay me back. But we would go with like a group of like eight, ten people or something like that to these bigger movies. And so I put one together for um, for uh, Skyfall, got everyone together. And we'd always go because the movies started at midnight. We were going to the midnight premieres on Thursday nights. And so we would go to this nearby restaurant called Earl's. Uh, it's a chain here. I don't know if it's carried over there. Very popular. This, this is very important information for this uh, podcast. Keep going, Cam. Yes. So I had everyone gathered there, and it's like 11.30 at night. We've just kind of finished up having basically post-dinner snacks and whatever. And the server is coming to get all our bills. And she says, oh, what are you guys up to now? And I said, oh, we're going to the opening night of Skyfall. And she said, you guys too. There was a bunch of people here for that last night. Right. And I went pale as a ghost as I pulled up my tickets frantically and realized that the event was last night and that I now had 10 dead tickets. The guy sitting in your row on the release night must have thought he won the lottery. Look at all these schmucks who didn't turn up. I could put all my bags here. And to make matters worse, uh, my buddy Tommy had been really interested in this girl, Kat. And so I arranged they'd never been out there'd been kind of a touch and go about would these two get together would they not and so i invited cat to this event so the two of them could actually kind of have their first date at least in a group setting and so she was there too and i felt horrible so i basically had to be like well everyone um sorry <laughs> cock blocker cam oh cam i was about to ask if you offer a bond matchmaking service because i'd be down but it sounds like your services are somewhat ineffective. Well, I redeemed myself because I very quickly turned to Kat and said, very sorry, is there any chance you're available tomorrow night and we'll get everyone back together tomorrow night? And she said yes. And now Tommy and Kat have been married for several years and have two young boys. That's insane. Wow. The Bond matchmaking service works. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yes, we all went the next night and... Uh, I really enjoyed it a lot, and I think I had some maybe doubts just because of Quantum. I didn't hate Quantum, but I wasn't necessarily showing up to this with the expectation it would be a home run. Uh, it was a little bit of that, oh, we'll see, we'll see. But I remember walking out quite happy. Um, the Dark Knight elements that were very strong in the film definitely were jumping out to me at the time. And uh, I, I do remember the one little negative quibble I had was my friend Simon, who was another huge Bond fan who was there. I remember him and I afterwards just saying, I, I look forward to when these movies are really fun again because they're very heavy and they've gotten heavy since 
you know, Casino Royale. So it wasn't even like a criticism of the movie, more like, I think the two of us aging Bond fans who grew up in the Roger Moore, Brosnan era were kind of like, okay, these things are getting really heavy. I wonder if we're going to pivot this around. But that's really my main memories. It's interesting because I would say this is probably one of the most fun of Daniel Craig's. I think that says more about the tone of Daniel Craig's films, though. Sure. I I, I don't think I, I had that reaction to it. And I think we'll get into the Dark Knight stuff because I don't think I've ever really drawn that distinction between the two. But we'll, we'll save that for a second. Um, the only other bit of background information I had about it, seeing as Cam is, is telling us a story about his uh, Skyfall dating app, um, <laughs> is... It... Skyfall in love. Oh. oh. Make that a web page right now, Cam. Lock it down before someone else does. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is a weird little anecdote, but you'll recall in the film you get a glamour shot of James Bond swimming in a lovely looking pool on the top of a, a tower. Um, well, that was a composited shot because that pool was never actually there. He swam in a pool in London and that was cut into the shot. The pool belonged to the company I used to work for and they uh, made a big song and dance about Daniel Craig turning up and being part of the shot. And uh, it was on our internet homepage for about a year. They were very proud of that. Um, so, yeah, I, I suppose our company was slightly connected to the film. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. That's cool. I, I'm not going to tell you which company, but it rhymes with Virgin Bactive. <laughs> gotcha. Mm-hmm. But I think before we can talk about what we think now in 2023, Cam, I want to know, how did we go from the Quantum of Solace to Skyfall? Yeah, so they developed, uh, started developing Skyfall immediately after Quantum of Solace came out around 2009. They brought back um, Neil Purvis and Robert Wade, who've been with the Bond franchise for quite a while and will be there going forward. And they paired them up with Peter Morgan, who uh, is probably best known now as the creator of The Crown, but had written films like The Last King of Scotland, The Queen, as well as um, Rush. Um, and they came up with a treatment called Once Upon a Spy. And that film pitch revolved around a past indiscretion of M's in Russia that came back to haunt her. And it would go down some very dark roads. It would end with Bond having to kill M, being forced to do so. And basically, they just didn't have a lot of confidence in this take. Um, I think later, uh, Wade said he had misgivings about it and said that um, Peter Morgan was much more of a Lacare guy than an Ian Fleming guy. And so it just was a much darker version. I mean, Bond has tried to go that way a couple of times, but I never think that the two stars particularly mesh very well. No, no. And it was really very shortly after this treatment was handed in that Sam Mendes was hired. And Sam Mendes, I think most people know who he is now, you know, Oscar winning, very acclaimed director of uh, movies like 1917, for example. But at the time, he was a very, or before that, he was a very acclaimed theater director who'd spent years in the theater, had won, you know, Tony Awards, worked for the Royal Shakespearean Company, and had directed actors like Judi Dench and Ray Fiennes. So uh, very well known. And it wasn't until 1999 he really moved into Hollywood with American Beauty, which of course won Best Picture, Best Director, Best Actor. It was a huge, basically coming out party for this theater director moving into film. And he just went on and did stuff like Road to Perdition, which Daniel Craig appeared in, Jarhead, uh, Revolutionary Road. And this was his follow-up to Away We Go. And I just have to say, I Mm. really don't like American Beauty. I like American Beauty. I was less, uh, less, you know, content with uh, Revolutionary Road or Away We Go. I can't say I've seen either of those films. I just remember being like, this is one of the films you have to see before you die. Watch this bag float in the air for 10 minutes. I just, oh. oh, but it's so it's so tough to watch any film after you've been told it's one of the ones that will define your entire cinema-going experience. That's mm-hmm. true, that's true. I, I, I should... That's without the paperback. That's, yeah, that is without the bag. Good point. And apparently, Sam Mendes, the way he got this job, not the story you hear from a lot of Bond directors. So uh, he was approached by Daniel Craig at Hugh Jackman's birthday party. And Craig was like, hey, would you like to direct a Bond movie. And Sam Mendes said he'd never really thought about it, but yes, yes, he really would. He would love to make a Bond film. And he said it just kind of snowballed from there. I'm guessing Daniel Craig went back to Eon, said he was interested, and it just, yeah. Did he really say it like Oliver Twist, though? Like how you just acted it out? Yes, please, sir. (laughs) Could I do your Bond film? (laughs) 
That's exactly... I was actually just playing a recording there. That wasn't actually me. Well, this has all been Catherine the whole time, so it's... Uh, mm. Oh, exactly. Right. Come on, keep up. And so once Mendy's came on, they just scrapped everything and started over um, with really, I'd say, the element of M having a maybe past indiscretion that came back to haunt her. I think that kind of stuck around, but everything else was out the window. And Mendes came in and he was very specific about what he wanted. He want, wanted the movie to be about Bond being lost and having to find himself again. He also wanted to bring back classic elements like a great villain that was very important to him was the villain had to be along the lines of, you know, a Goldfinger, a Dr. No, like some of these icons. He also wanted to bring back a lot of the in-jokes of the series, which the previous two had kind of stripped out. And also things like the DB5. He really wanted the DB5 back in there. Was that because it was targeted for the 50th anniversary or was it more just because Sam wanted sort of the hallmarks, as it were? My guess is it was more because those are the Bond movies he loved and it just happened to coincide very well with the 50th. But then does, does that not imply that sort of, I mean, Mark Forster, we could leave to one side for a second, but that Martin Campbell didn't have a strong enough sway to be like, hey, we need these things. Whereas Casino Royale didn't have any of those things, particularly except for the DB5. Well, I think Sam Mendes has a certain amount of clout that Martin Campbell does not. I mean, Sam Mendes is coming in as an Oscar winner, prestige filmmaker. They're really lucky to have him because going forward, we're going to have some real powerhouse directors. I'm sure in the future of Bond, they're going to be looking at top tier directors. But in the past, they typically hired more like the journeyman type, people that were like really good craftsmen that would come on board. So like getting a Mendes, I remember at the time being legit shocked he was doing it. Hey, stop, stop punching down at Lee Tamahori. <laughs> well, I mean, I like Lee Tamahori's, some of his work too, but he was not someone with like clout. He was not a major director name. I agree. He didn't have any clout. Yeah. And so um, Mendy said another big element was The Dark Knight. He said that movie was instrumental in him wanting to do this because he just felt that was a complete game changer. And he wanted to bring to this film what The Dark Knight had done for Batman. And I'll bring up some points about that later on. And the Broccoli's, it was very important to them that this movie explore the relationship between Bond and M. So you can kind of see that right from the beginning, people had pretty strong ideas of what this movie had to be about, at least thematically. It's interesting that there wasn't so much, well, I'm not hearing so far that there wasn't much pressure to be celebratory of the anniversary. It was more just they had to change direction from Quantum of Solace because of, I think the, the feedback that that film got, much as we think it's unfairly sort of derided. Mm, yeah, I think that's right. And also, like, this production period was delayed by MGM bankruptcy issues. So they spent about a year on ice, unable to get a green light to start shooting this movie. And so it just led to them having lots of time to write this movie. Like Mendy said, it was just a luxury that they were able to refine everything before shooting. So when you're asking about the 50th anniversary, if this movie's delayed because of bankruptcy issues for a period of time, was it always going to be a 50th anniversary movie? Well, looking at the pace in which they brought the last two out, it was two year gaps. So theoretically, I imagine they would have thought they would have had the fourth one out by the time this happens. Yeah, or well, or be developing the fourth, because I would think if they're looking at a two year gap, maybe 2011 for this one. Sure. I, I think it, yeah. I, I think it's just serendipitous. Yes, totally. That it ended up here. Totally. And so the first draft was called Nothing is Forever, and a lot of the elements were in place. So Q was written into it. Raul Sousa was a character, later renamed Silva. And the plot to kill M was instrumental to the movie, as well as the character of Mallory, who at the time was called Malander. There was a few things that were a little off. Um, Sousa's plan was quite different, involved like bombing a train in Barcelona. Did his plan make sense at this point? I don't know. You'll have to read uh, Nothing is Forever. <laughs> um, and also, there was going to be an amnesia plot where Bond had amnesia after being shot and would impregnate a woman named Lily in Turkey, who I'm guessing is the character we see very briefly in this film, who would show up later in the movie. And it Sorry, would, I'm it, just getting a call from Robert Ludlum. He says he wants his story back. <laughs> And it would also apparently um, echo Heart of Darkness by Conrad. Okay. Okay. Well, there's, there's nuggets there that has obviously evolved into what we have. Yes. Yes. Um, and on one of the rewrites of that first draft, that's when Purvis and Wade brought in the whole Skyfall concept. And 
so basically at this point, the MGM bankruptcy threat eased. And so Sam Mendes brought in John Logan, who was an acclaimed playwright, got his start in the 90s. He wrote a spec script for what became Any Given Sunday, the Oliver Stone NFL film. Um, he'd also uh, made films like, uh, well, he co-wrote Gladiator, uh, The Aviator, Rango. So pretty major name. And this was his follow-up to Rang or to Hugo, I should say, Martin Scorsese's Hugo. And uh, he would go on we'll talk about him in the future because he is actually a key contributor to specter as well but with these rewrites um the names were changed to the names in the movie um monty penny was added into the script and also the skyfall finale was solidified and the character of king Cade was hammered down thank god um originally well the rumor's always been that sean connery was supposed to play this role they did ask sam mendes about this and he said it was discussed way, way early on. Exact quote, way, way early on as an idea, but dropped because they just thought it would be way too distracting. I remember having a full-blown argument on Twitter a year or so ago about this very little this little factoid that as quoted from Sam Mendes himself, who made the film, mm. uh, and said I was wrong. So uh, there's your fact, folks. Look it up. Yes, yes. And before shooting, they did bring in uncredited writer Jez Butterworth who's probably best known at the time for the movie Fair Game, the, the Naomi Watts spy film, as well as the um, Nicole Kidman film Birthday Girl. Since then, he's worked on movies like Edge of Tomorrow, for example. But he did an uncredited rewrite right before production. We'll talk more about him when we talk about Spectre, because he is credited on Spectre. I have nothing to add to that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's fair enough. And uh, as for the cast, um, Javier Bardem... Mendes lobbied hard to get him. Like, they really wanted him to the point where they started writing Bardem's name into the script as the villain before he was even cast. Did he crack out his Oliver Twist voice again? No, I will not do the Oliver Twist voice. Javier, eh? <laughs> will you do my film? <laughs> but in the script pages, they would actually just write Bardem as the Silva character. Well, it's fascinating because we've had quite a lot of screenwriters on the show at this point, and they they always say, no, I didn't have an actor in mind particularly... It's nice to see that they had this one nailed down. Mm -hmm. I, I think it shows in the performance of Silver. And a bit of a game changer, too, because, you know, Bardem, Oscar winner at the time for No Country for Old Men. And if you look at the Bond villains of the next two, they're going after Oscar winners every time. Christoph Waltz and um, Rami Malek, both, you know, supporting actor and actor winners. Mm -hmm. Very true. Mm-hmm. And Ray Fiennes, obviously, was brought in by Sam Mendes. He had been considered in the past to play Bond in Goldeneye. So, Fates finally worked out for him getting into one of these movies. Well, he got the Avengers instead. Um, he's doing fine. Yes, yes. And the behind-the-scenes crew was switched up because Sam Mendes brought in some of his own people. So, you had Roger Deakins coming in as cinematographer. Um, and this was the first Bond film ever shot on digital. And then also um, you had um, Thomas Newman coming in to score the film. So David Arnold just wasn't invited back because of that reason. Um, Newman was a frequent collaborator with Sam Mendes. I, I want to get into the score in a little bit. But yeah, it it, it happened again because you think Quantum had the same thing where Mark Forster bought his own team in, uh, except for a few people like David Arnold who stuck around. And this is, again, the same sort of thing of, these these directors bringing their own team that they trust, which I completely understand. You work with the same sort of people. You know what they're capable of. I totally get it. Yeah. And so this movie had a budget of $200 million. Domestically, it did 304.4. International, 804.2. With a worldwide total of $1.1 billion. That's a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. And this is the first Bond film to ever break a billion dollars at the global box office. Hasn't done it again, right? Will it ever, with theatrical models going the way they are? That's the question. I don't know. If they do something very special with Bond 28 or 26, depending on who you ask, uh, yeah, potentially. You never know. I think it's possible. Maverick is out there. Avatar's out there. There's still there's films that can do it. Mm -hmm. uh, does it have the sort of social currency to get there now? I don't know. The question often is, too, with Bond, North America doesn't typically respond quite as strongly as the international. So, like, um, you look, for example, this one made 304, but, like, the previous two did about 160. So this pretty much doubled the take for a Bond film in North America. 
I think a lot of that was the 50th anniversary, that sort of Olympics thing, all sort of tied in. It was a perfect storm. It was. Great reviews, um, a really fantastic trailers. I think it just kind of was a perfect storm. Good soundtrack. Good, uh, you know, the Adele song, which we haven't spoken about yet, but mm -hmm. very important when it comes to awards season. Yeah, totally. And the top three for the year, number one was The Avengers, number two was Skyfall, and number three was The Dark Knight Rises. That's a solid year of cinema right there. Oh, it is. We've had some dire ones. This was a good one. A lot of sequels, I'll point out. Uh, yeah, no, that's true. That is true. And this movie was the most lauded Bond film I think we've ever had. So with the Oscars, it won the first ever original song for a Bond film. It also won Best Sound Editing. I know, right, Scott? Like, uh, there's been a lot of Bond songs nominated, but they've never won. Didn't The Look of Love get one? Nominated. Ah, uh, my apologies. Yeah. And uh, it was also nominated for cinematography, original score, and sound mixing. The BAFTAs, they loved this movie, Scott. They loved it. And you know it. <laughs> we, we love a bit of Bond, man. That's our thing. It won Best British Film. It won Best Film Music or Score. And it was nominated for Supporting Actor for Bardem, Supporting Actress for Dench, Cinematography, Editing, Production Design, and Sound. The Screen Actors Guild gave this movie the Best Action Performance by Stunt Ensemble, which was a big deal for that entire stunt team that makes these movies, what they are. And uh, also Bardem was nominated by the Screen Actors Guild for his supporting turn. The PGAs nominated um, Barbara Broccoli and Michael G. Wilson for Producers of the Year off the success of this. And I'm sure you're thinking, like, what about Daniel Craig? Isn't he instrumental to why this movie works? Well, the MTV Movie Awards, <laughs> they recognize Daniel Craig. <laughs> they nominated him for Best Shirtless Performance. <laughs> a uh, award that he lost to Taylor Lautner for Breaking Dawn Part 2. I bet he's gutted. <laughs> He'll always have that sort of uh, weighing him down. He <laughs> lost to Taylor Lautner for Breaking Dawn Part 2. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. A film I also saw in theaters. <laughs> you thought Bond had it dire at the start of this movie. You should have seen him when those uh, winners were announced. <laughs> <laughs> I was beaten by a werewolf. <laughs> I worked out so hard. <laughs> And that wraps me up for the behind the scenes on Skyfall. Well, we're here. We've parachuted out of the helicopter with the Queen and her corgis. It's time to talk about Skyfall. Catherine, we need to know, what do you think of Skyfall in the year 2023? It's a film that gets better every time I watch it, but it's one that I wasn't originally very sold on. I thought it was a bit too much uh, sort of theme over Bond. But then the more I watch it, the theme just becomes intrinsic to Daniel Craig's version of Bond, so it makes perfect sense within the full canon of every Daniel Craig film. So it becomes less of an issue, and then the glorious, classic Bond elements really, really come into sharp focus when I rewatch it now. I wrote down it's sort of my thoughts, and it sort of ties in very well with what you said there, Catherine. If you're looking for a Daniel Craig Bond film to play by the rule book of a classic Bond film, this is your film. Yeah. This is exactly what you would go for. It has all of those tick boxes that they basically devised in Goldfinger. Yeah, it's like it's like they sat down, watched Goldfinger at some point, and then just cross-referenced it with everything that's going on in Skyfall, just to make sure they've got every little element ticked off. It's a very, like, classy production, which pre-Daniel Craig, I feel like the movies had kind of faltered. You know, when you go back to, like, the 60s, there's very much an element to make the Bond films, like, these kind of high-class blockbusters. You know, you look at Goldfinger, for example. And then you kind of get into the Moore era, which goes kind of campy. Um, and I like the Daltons, and I like the Brosnan eras, but they don't have that kind of high-refined level of filmmaking and it feels like the Craig era definitely brought it back with uh, Casino Royale but this was the one where it kind of was perfected it's like Casino Royale grabbed everyone's attention but Skyfall was the one where all the elements just came into place perfectly to be that kind of perfect storm of a blockbuster well I throw it back to you for a second there Catherine before we talk about Cam and I's thoughts why do you think it's grown on you over time hmm. that's such a good question I think I love the fact that this 
entire film is essentially about what we love most as Bond film fans and as Bond book fans. All those elements that we love about Bond, he is fighting to preserve throughout the entire film. And he is within this context of uh, an MI6 that is questioning if the double O's are even worth it. So I love that it's a film about preserving what we, the fans, love about Bond. And he is fighting to continue to bring the, the traditional elements back into his modern day. Which is kind of the perfect, I said the perfect storm earlier, but I'll, I'll slightly rephrase it. The perfect, perfect recipe, perhaps, for it being the 50th anniversary of Bond. Again, it's that lightning in a bottle moment. They've crafted this script to talk to Bond's history whilst also dealing with Bond's personal history with M in the film. There's a lot going on here. There's probably quite a lot of deep analysis you could do about this film, which don't worry, we're not going to do here. You never expect deep analysis from us. It also feels like one of the the best examples of the creators asking the question and then answering it as to why the world needs James Bond. Because it's the sort of thing that's brought up constantly with this franchise over the various decades. There's invariably reviews that are like, do we really need these movies anymore? And we had Goldeneye, for example, kind of interrogating the character and saying, what does this mean in the 1990s? But I feel like this was probably the best example we have of building an entire movie around who James Bond is and why he's important. Absolutely. But Cam, it, it seemed like you weren't as sold on it when you saw it the first time. What do you think about it now? It wasn't that I wasn't sold. It was more that, like, to me, so much of the hoopla around the movie was like, this is the greatest Bond film ever. Uh, quite possibly, or at least the easily the best Daniel Craig, whereas I always preferred Casino Royale. So it wasn't like it was a I don't like Skyfall. It was always like I didn't see it as the be-all, end-all of James Bond. I, I think there's other examples that also belong in the high plateaus as well. It wasn't a, you know, like when Dark Knight came out, it was like this is the best Batman movie, and it was hard to argue with that. Mm -hmm. Whereas I feel like with Bond, there's much more of a conversation that existed at that point in time with the release of Skyfall. Which which makes sense. I, I, I think, I mean, we'll probably tackle this question when we do our Craig roundtable down the road at some point. But I, I think there's an argument to be made for Casino Royale or Skyfall being the best. But I think it depends on what you want from your Bond film, yeah. Mm-hmm, definitely. Yeah, and for me, this one, I think... When I look at the various Bond eras, there tends to be like a definitive Bond movie of the decade. And I think it's impossible to argue that this one is the defining Bond film of the 2010s. And it is the one that is going to affect all the Bond movies we're going to talk about going forward, whether it's Spectre or No Time to Die. They're all existing within the shadow of this movie, the way that in the 60s, Bond films were with Goldfinger. Or even in the 70s, a little bit with Spy Who Loved Me. This one, to me, is just the perfect combination of elements to you know bring bond into this time period and make it really matter and get everyone excited i think it has one of the series great villains i think bardem's work as silva is just top tier i remember in theaters being very aware of the popular trope of the villain who's captured and that's all part of their plan because we saw that in the dark knight with the joker but we also saw it, that's, you know, the previous summer with Loki in the Avengers. And I remember being very aware of that and kind of like ticking off some of the elements that were recognizable to me. But at the same time, that's not even that much of a criticism because Bond notoriously jumps on trends. They do it all the time. So it's like, you know. Look at Quantum. Look at Casino Royale. It's, uh, it's Bond riffs. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, when I'm seeing Silva dress as a police officer. And go after kind of the head of law and order. It's like, oh, right, the Joker in the Dark Knight. I did see that. Or the kind of the shift in location from, you know, our typical hero headquarters to this new, to these new digs, which, wait a second, didn't that happen in the Dark Knight as well? Oh, wait, it did. Um, there's a lot of stuff like that that I find more fun now. At the time, I think I was more, a little frustrated that maybe that I felt it wasn't quite as creative as it should be. But to me now, it's settled into kind of just the whole recipe of the movie. It is kind of reflecting the trends of the time. And I think it does it incredibly well. I do find the back section of this movie kind of sags a little bit for me, you know, on the rewatches. Um, once we get to the um, Straw Dogs slash, I guess people say Home Alone kind of sequences in the ending, 
But um, no, overall, I think this one is uh, pretty astonishing in terms of uh, filmmaking. And I think at the time, too, I was not as willing to jump in the Sam Indies, you know, kind of bed celebrating this one that a lot of people were. Because I wasn't a huge Sam Mendes fan. I liked American Beauty, but I wasn't like a... If they'd hired someone else, like, I don't know, like a Quentin Tarantino, I'm sure I would have been just thunderously applauding in the streets. Whereas Sam Mendes, I had a little more of a... Eh, I like some of his stuff. I don't like some of it. So I wasn't as in the bag for him. But uh, looking back now, it's like, no, no he, he really nailed it. Well, I mean, you've shot your credibility in the foot by saying the stuff at Skyfall was not very good because it had Kincaid in it. So how could it be bad? Yeah, it's this character that's not set up at all and just shows up in the last 20 minutes. <laughs> but it's Kincaid. Good <laughs> Lord. Welcome to Scotland. It's like, yes, tell him. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I get what you're saying. And I completely agree. I'm glad it's it's grown on you over time and i know what you mean by like not being in the bag for sam mendes i didn't really care who was directing it particularly at that point i wasn't a scholar of film nor am i now particularly but yeah i i can see the angle you're coming from and i know i mean that's this is the thing and i was sort of alluding to it earlier some people will say casino royale is the best craig film. Some people will say skyfall is i would say this is probably the most enjoyable of craig's mm. films because it does everything right it may not be pushing the envelope like casino royale did or quantum did in its own way it's really playing it safe at times. It's sticking to the, the tick boxes formed by Goldfinger, like I said. But it's also hitting everything perfectly. It is, unlike Daniel Craig as James Bond shooting at Target in the film, <laughs> it's hitting the mark. So, I mean, yeah, to speak to my thoughts about it, but I've sort of alluded to it already. This is a great film, and it's the easiest one for me to watch. I am a Pierce Brosnan fan. Pierce Brosnan brought me into the fold. I love Goldeneye. I love Tomorrow Never Dies. They're both great romps. This is the great romp of the Daniel Craig era, and I love a romp. <laughs> and I think it's interesting that as much as I cite that it was kind of capturing popular trends of blockbusters at the time, it's very classic Bond. I mean, this movie in many ways is kind of like a stealth remake of The Man with the Golden Gun where you have, like, the Severin character is very much like Maud Adams' character in Man of the Golden Gun. They're bringing, you know, Bond to this deserted island that this guy runs. It's like, ooh, there's some definite similarities. The whole mirror-Bond aspect of, like, you know, his shadowy self. Again, Man with the Golden Gun. So, like, I like that this movie feels like a 2012 blockbuster, reflecting all the trends of that particular point in time, while also paying tribute to the classic Bond elements of the character's cinematic past, as well as there's a lot of Ian Fleming here and a lot of tribute and attention paid to Bond's literary past as well. I can't really speak to that as the man here that hasn't read any of the books. Actually, I've read two, but apart from that, I haven't read any of the other ones. But uh, I, I have to... Catherine, you sort of alluded to the fact that you've read them all, though. Yes, that was actually my most thorough introduction to Bond. I grew up watching a handful of the films, but I read all of the books. And only in recent years have I gone and discovered every film. Oh, wow, so that's usually the, it's the inverse. Usually, they, people discover the films and find the books. That's uh... this is what happens when you get a library nerd on the podcast. I have a I have a big question then. So you've read all the books, you've internalized them, you know these stories. What movie made your jaw drop the most when you saw the adaptation? Oh, don't. I mean, <sighs> Moonraker. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it could it couldn't really be any other one. <laughs> Fair enough. They're like, let's just take the name. Yeah, yeah. And let's just run off with this and take it in any direction we feel like. <laughs> yeah, it makes me sad. Well, you know, they say <laughs> the old ways are the best, and you know we like to talk about the positive things on this show. So let's do that first. Things that you liked, Catherine. Tell us something you liked about the film. I have to mention Money Penny. I have to. Sure. Absolutely. Great. Yeah. I thought this was wonderful. I don't think as Bond fans we ever thought we would get to see Money Penny pre desk. But we do. And that's quite exciting. Even if you're not a mega fan like me, I think it's still really interesting. And I'm wondering if for people who weren't as familiar with all the icons, iconography of Bond, whether they'd immediately think of Eve as, oh, that's going to be Moneypenny. Because for Bond fans, you can see it coming a mile off. 
Yeah, and I remember during kind of the development, the rumor started leaking out it was Monty Penny. And they fought very hard on the press tour that, nope, nope, it's not Monty Penny. Naomi Harris was saying she was not playing Monty Penny. She was playing Eve because they wanted that surprise at the end of the movie. But yeah, it was like we all kind of knew when we went and saw the movie. Cam, hit red alert. I'm getting John Harrison vibes from Star Trek Into <laughs> Darkness here. True. Yes. Yes. Another trend that would uh, continue. That trend would continue onwards. Yes. Unfortunately so. Um, I, I would also I put my hand up. We we would uh, Catherine. And I was sort of laughing without talking about it just now. But I did not know that it was Money Penny. And when the uh, the ball dropped, as it were, the sky ball dropped at the end of the film. <laughs> That's awful. <laughs> Uh, the, mm, yeah, probably don't. Probably don't. Actually, leave it in. Fine. Make it. Make a. Make a fool of me. I did not know it was coming, and I remember going, "Oh, oh all right then." Yeah, <laughs> Scott was the one guy in the theater. <laughs> I, I was clapping. I was like, "Yeah, yeah, I like that twist." Sorry, <laughs> you were doing that point at the screen gif. <laughs> yeah, I invented yeah. that. Uh, Brad Pitt stole it from me. Yeah. Um. Well, Cam, what about you? Something that you liked. I mean, I feel like I kind of have to lump everyone together and just say, like, all of the supporting cast of this movie bring everything so to life. I think, like, Mendes, while I've been mixed on his past work, a great director of actors. And I'm sure that comes largely from many, many years in the theater. But you look at the work he's getting out of Judy Dench, Ray Fiennes, Bard M, um, Naomi Harris. It's like everyone's on the same page and he's working hard to make Every performance matter. Every character matters in a way. And I think there's like a low-key element of this one that's very important, which is building this movie around M, which mm -hmm. had never really been done before in a Bond film. And it's not heavy-handed at all. It's very subtle. But the way that he makes Silva's entire mission about M is the sort of thing that when I said this was kind of the definitive Bond movie of its time, of that decade, and I do consider No Time to Die kind of a 2010s movie because of the pandemic and all of that sort of thing. Like, that movie probably would have come out, you know, at the end of the 2010s if things had gone correctly. You look at what they do with Madeline Swan in that one, where she's the target of Safin the entire time. It's elements like that that I think were so important in Skyfall and so well pulled off. But it's like you just go down the supporting cast. It's a murderer's row. You know, like you look at the Berenice Marlowe character of Severin. Imagine what that character would have been in like, even like a, you know, Brosnan movie or a Roger Moore movie. It would have been a throwaway character. You would have maybe had an iconic moment or two because typically they're very good at capturing iconic moments with, you know, various Bond actresses. But it would not have been this. Well, she's Paris Carver. Sure. Yeah. And that didn't get the best ending. No. Uh, no. Or, nor did Maude Adams playing, you know, Andrea Anders, I think, in um, The Man with the Golden Gun. Yeah, great point. And, like, the tragedy. And I always look at that scene with Severin where she's talking to Bond at the casino and he mentions Silva and her hand, like, does that slight tremble. And I'm like, holy mm -hmm. smokes. Like, there's an attention to detail that Mendes brings working with all of these actors that is just top tier. I, I'm glad you brought that little quiver up because i think that i i noticed that again today and i was like oh that's such a nice touch it's subtle it doesn't it, like the camera doesn't zoom in on her hand it's just like oh yeah you see that that's good um but I, just speaking to the silver point i think that's important to dig into just a little bit there this is craig's strongest villain mm -hmm. and it shows they cast it right obviously they knew who they wanted but they cast it right for the role and it's someone that could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Daniel Craig. Not to, to sort of talk against anyone that's come before, but I don't think, I don't think they, just, they just don't equate to this. They just don't live up to this level. I think like Mads Mikkelsen is pretty darn close, but he also doesn't have... The movie's not as interested in him as this movie is with mm. Silva and the way they're thematically tying Silva into it. You get a big payoff. Whereas like Le Chiffre being kind of shot you know unceremoniously by uh you know his, these people he's crossed eh, it doesn't have the d the denouement that like this movie does where it's like it's carrying it beginning to end and i think there was an el a certain aspect of them wanting to strip away bond elements with the previous two and i think that really impacted the way the villains were treated and this movie is saying no no the villain is the big show uh, well Catherine, what did you think of silver 
he is in my top three villains depending on how i'm feeling that shifts i think he's exceptional he is gleeful in his in his role he's a villain who's so self-aware and i love that he tries to use bond's perceived heteronormative ways against him mm. by flirting with him as a as a fear tactic at the in, in their first meeting um and then he's genuinely terrifying oh yeah yeah it, like that scene where he pulls his sort of jaw out again took me by surprise in the theaters and i was just I, I was not expecting that to happen i love that they save that reveal for quite far down the line we've had several scenes with silver before we see that sort of physical affectation to be something that makes him extra frightening there's a level of like horror to that moment that i just remember being unprepared for when I saw it in theaters, because you typically just don't get that sort of moment in a Bond film. And just the way that plays off of Judy Dench and what she's put her agents through. Like you, I feel kind of bad for Judy Dench because a lot of the focus in the movies came from mistakes she'd made that came back to haunt her, which did not, you didn't get those sorts of stories with say the male M's in the past, you know, the Bernard Lee or the Robert Browns, but those movies also weren't interested in M. And I am glad that they, did that a little more in No Time to Die with Ray Fiennes. I'd say giving M's character a chance to redeem herself, to mm -hmm. stand by her principles, uh, gives gives M such a such a depth that we've not been allowed to to see with M before, at least not to this extent. The line "To hell with dignity, I'll leave when the job's done" <laughs> is delicious. And and she gets to shoot a gun. Yeah, she gets to make explosives out of light bulbs. Yeah, yeah. Like, you get to see... I mean, people always talk about, hey, it's Q in the field. We get to see Q with little Nelly. Woohoo. I We get to see M in the field and kick an ass. Well, she misses, but she's still kicking ass. She does the old light switch thing. Women firing weapons in this film don't, don't do very well. That is true. That is true. That is true. I, I actually want to come back to that in a minute. I, but I also want to come back to something you, you touched on, Catherine. I had it for my sort of notes at the end, but I think it's an important note to focus on for a second, which is... This is the only film, really, to probe, maybe the wrong word, the <laughs> heteronormative, we'll use your phrase, or the sort of the perceived he hegemonic masculinity of James Bond, this unapproachable bastion of what people used to think is, of straightness, which I don't think is, is true at all. I think if, if you research spies, even in the slightest, most of them have to, as a vocation, be bisexual by nature because they have to adapt to their mission. So I, I love that this film takes a beat, just a beat, to sort of go, hey now, what makes you think this is my first time? Mm -hmm. I think that's the first time I ever applauded during a Bond film in the cinema when, when that line came, came through. I, I couldn't believe that they were daring to take it in that direction, and it made so much sense. And I know they were quite nervous about that scene as well. When they were writing it, they were like, will this get by? Like, are they going to get nervous at the last minute? And it was so well timed out by Sam Indies. They had to work with Bardem about the long walk down that hallway and time it all. And I honestly think this might be the best scene in all of the Craig films, like bar none. I don't know if there's... The only thing I could say is maybe the parkour sequence at the start of Casino Royale. But uh, I don't know. That whole Bardem walk and talk followed by kind of this flirtation with Bond, I, it really looms over that entire era for me. It tells you so much about the character of James Bond and of Silver with really not saying much at all, especially from James. And I, I just love that. I just I think it's important to remember. And also, I think they spoke about it in that recent documentary that Apple put out, Being James Bond, I think it was called, where they, they spoke about wanting to pull that scene and being quite nervous about it. And I think, retrospectively, I'm glad it's there. And I hope they explore that more in the future. I mean, I think there's an element of the Dark Knight here with just the Batman-Joker relationship was going to these very interesting, dark, challenging places. And I think that was probably what gave them a little bit of bravery here was to do that with Bond. And thank God, because I like elements like this. I like when they explore characters and take them to uncomfortable places. And that is not something you get a lot of in modern franchise management. They don't want to do that. They want to give you what's safe and what you'll you know, kind of eat up and come back for more with. I like that here they were at least pushing the audience a little bit. Absolutely. And if we're going to talk about my like and talk about pushing the audience and maybe pushing the envelope a little bit as well, 
the visuals of this film. You've got Roger Deakins behind the camera. You've got a master at play here, but, you know, talk about Macau, that, that ride into the casino. Good Lord, that is gorgeous. You talk about the fight in Shanghai. Again, such a gorgeous sequence, but also it works from an editing standpoint. Like they cut it together really well, Stuart Baird. Fantastic work from him. And I can only tip my hat if I was wearing one to both of them for pre presenting such a gorgeous Bond film. Yeah, I mean... The Bond films are always known as these works of great craftsmanship, and this is one where it's like you just elevate it that extra amount. When you've got Roger Deakins, one of the all-time greatest cinematographers, Stuart Baird, very accomplished editor, one of the best in the business, it's like all the things that I think people took for granted with past Bond films are just raised to that level that you can't ignore them. It's so well done. You look at that opening sequence you know, with them, with Bond and Monty Penny in pursuit of you know this terrorist character and the way it winds up on the train with the digger not only is it just incredibly well staged but also it looks just eye-popping and i like the way that this movie whether it's the action scenes or even just an introductory sequence in macau where bond is coming in on that little boat with all the lanterns in the water every one of these moments you could like freeze frame and use as you know the wallpaper on your computer Absolutely. And and also just the, some of the, the sequences you mentioned, the chase at the beginning with the digger on the train, but also just the stuff through the underground. As a Londoner, it's great to see the Met line, a tube line I use frequently with James Bond riding <laughs> on it. That's kind of cool. And sliding down the thing, which you can't do, folks. TFL do not let you do that. There are things in the way. Oh. Uh, and also just the, the attack on Skyfall. Some people don't like it. Some say it's Home Alone, Me, James Bond. Ah, I get lost. It's fun. It's action based, but it makes sense. Uh, maybe Javier Bardem's mission doesn't make sense, but it looks good too. And I just think it's some wonderful stuff. It's very moody. And I remember when we talked about the Macintosh man, there was what that a shot of like, what a pull. <laughs> there was that shot of like the burning building in the background when they're out in the, uh, mm. the highlands. And there's a shot in this movie that's just as beautiful, if not far more so. So what you're saying is Roger Deakins had been watching the Macintosh man before he made Skyfall. I pray that he was. Oh man. I pray that he was. That, that's 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 a post this week on social media. You can damn well bet. Um, yeah. But speaking of damn, let's damn this film a little bit and talk about dislikes, things that we didn't like. There got to be a couple of things, some nitpicks for sure. Catherine, we'll go to you first. Something you weren't happy with with the film. I'd like to touch upon the shower scene. Yep. Mm, yeah, that was in mine. I want to give it the benefit of the doubt. I want to say she likes him. I want to say... She's doing this because she is just as in control of the situation as he is, but she absolutely isn't. And it's unusual to feel a little uncomfortable watching a scene where Bond seduces a woman because so often it's presented as the prize and you're like, good on you, mate. And it's good news. It's a positive payoff. But it isn't in this case and it's just a bit jarring and I'm not ever quite sure entirely how I'm meant to feel about it. And also the fact that, like, they set up she was, like, being sex trafficked when she was, like, 12 or 13. It's like, okay, that's incredibly heavy. Yeah. And then you're cutting to him, yeah, like, sneaking in on her into the shower with her. And I was, like, yeah. making notes because that's a sequence I think has been well criticized over the past number of years especially. And I think even at the time was weird. I think a lot of people had that reaction to it. I wish I could understand, and I've never heard the filmmakers talk very much about it as to why they made that specific choice or what they were thinking. I think it was maybe an element of they want two incredibly damaged people to come together because Bond is also very damaged in his own way. That's my guess, but it doesn't, it doesn't play well. I contrast it in my mind to the shower scene in Casino Royale. Yeah. Where he comforts Vesper. He gives her a hug. Because she's struggling. Severin is struggling just as much mm -hmm. in that scene, but he decides to do everything else. One thing that features in that scene with Vesper is a very powerful and important word, and that's consent. Yeah. This reminds me more of the sauna scene from Thunderball. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or, or the hay scene mm -hmm. from Goldfinger. Yeah. Now, when they said, hey, we wanted to remake Goldfinger a little bit with this film, they didn't have to add that in, but. 
I, I just feel like it's missing one little beat where they where like Bond knocks or goes, I'm back, and she invites him in. I know it's Yes. Like it, maybe it's jazzier for having like, oh, he turns in its silhouettes, it's kind of seductive and sexy. It looks sexy in that sort of sense. It's framed that way. You don't really see them doing it. You see the silhouette. I understand. But there's just like an, a, a line of ADR. We have a voice artist on the show. I'm sure it's very easy to do that one little line to put it in the film. Certainly with the budget that this film was made with. Severin seems to be consenting. Mm-hmm. She doesn't seem to be resisting at all. But then within, within the context of her being a woman who's been trafficked as a child and been groomed into this lifestyle where when a man says he wants something, she says yes because that's her job, changes the context completely. So we would, I completely agree, Scott, just need a line from her where you can see that she wants him just as much as he wants her. Inviting him into the shower. Just, I, I know it loses some magic for some people, but I don't think we need that magic, thank you. I also have always, expanding on that, had issues with the way they dispatch of her in the movie as well. I remember in the theater being like, ugh, like, I'm not sure if they're trying to underline how ugly Bond villains truly are. Maybe the way that, like, they were showing how terrifying the Joker could be in the Dark Knight. Like, to really strip away the veneer of kind of comic book villain and show that these are awful, awful people as your villains. Maybe that's kind of what they're going for. But the whole thing just feels a little off. Uh, it's unnecessarily brutal to a character who we've been told has gone through a life of torment. Like, ugh. And then, like, the Bond reaction. I do believe in that moment Bond is horrified by it and is putting up this, like, this show of just turning that into an opportunity to take them all down and capture Silva. But the fact the character's never referenced in any way ever again, it just feels like... You know, there's a long trope in Bond films of the female Bond character who dies earlier on in the film. And they were, they were always kind of unceremoniously killed. And this movie feels like it wants to give weight to that character while also still just moving forward and never acknowledging that again. I completely agree. I, I wouldn't, I don't have a problem actually with how Severin is murdered, but I do have a problem with the way that she is effectively murdered in the script because you just, it's as if she never existed. I, again, could have just done with a little bit of, of a reaction from Daniel Craig. He loves to show emotion uh, in his films. It's not a problem for him. Uh, you know, just something him like flinching at the thought of her being so brutally murdered and, and removed from the film. Instead, he just makes a remark about the waste of scotch. Yeah. I have a theory about this line. It's one that's puzzled me for a long time. When I was re-watching it, I thought, are we being given the classic Bond one-liner? But now it's been recontextualized into a scene that is just brutal. So that when Bond is trying to fall back on his old ways of, oh, I'm, I'm just going to say waste of good, waste of good scotch, that as an audience, you're not laughing. It's not a wink. It's not a Roger Moore eyebrow anymore. It's, oh gosh, real stakes, real emotion. Like the audience winces. Yeah. And they see that like Bond uses these jokes as more of a defense mechanism than as a you know, <laughs> waka waka audience. Yeah, that's just my theory. I think it's hard to know exactly why that line is in there. That's the closest I can come to making sense of it. No, no. It, it, we, have to, we have to find our own way to sort of figure out why they do these things because, yeah, well, we can take questions to filmmakers whenever we get a chance, but I don't think we're going to speak to Sam Mendes anytime soon. And I do feel like Sam Mendes is a very particular director so he would have had a very specific reason for wanting to do this. And he's just never been very vocal about why. Because I, I don't think he's someone who just kind of is trying to make his days. <laughs> like, shoot the sequence. Yeah, good enough. Let's move on. I think he has intention behind a lot of what he wants to do. And was working, as I said, with the writers for a prolonged period of time because of the MGM issues. So, like, they were really refining everything on the page. So it may even be a case of what they came up with on the page just doesn't quite translate when you put it on the screen. Possibly. Uh, it's, it's definitely one of the scenes, both the scenes with Severin are, are ones that people talk about afterwards as, as, as clunky, maybe misjudged. So I definitely agree with that one, Catherine. But, uh, Cam, what about you? Something you didn't like? I think for me, I'll just uh, mention the, um, some of the stuff in the back section once we get to um, the uh, Skyfall area. I like the Skyfall location. I think it's really cool to go back to Bond's 
backstory because typically Bond has been kind of a static character who we don't explore in depth. Um, I like that he has a little bit of a Bruce Wayne story about being traumatized as a child and going into like a cave for a couple days and then emerging out as the character we all know and love. <laughs> you really are like drawing these lines between this and the Dark Knight, aren't you? You're just a big Batman fan. Should we be doing a Batman podcast? I am a big Batman fan, but I mean, I, the elements are really strong. I mean, <laughs> really you didn't strong. have to wear the cowl to the recording. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm actually wearing the Robin one, to be fair, from 66. <laughs> and the Speedo. <laughs> yeah. But for me, the back half of this, I think the issue for me is that the movie loses that propulsiveness it had for so much of the movie. And I think like Silva's plan, it's questionable. It's a little bit of the Joker thing of, I'm insane, but everything is just planned down to the finest detail, including this explosion in a wall where a train's going to come through at the perfect moment. I can kind of look past things like that, but when I get to the end of the movie, I feel like part of the problem is Silva's plan is kind of over, and so you don't kind of have this driving force through the finale. And then, you know, they're introducing stuff like the um, Kincaid and M using flashlights in the dark. And it's like, oh, God, like they're just trying to get to that finale moment of Silva and M in the church together, which I think is incredible, incredible moment between those two actors when he's holding the gun to their both of their heads and has stuck with me since the first time I saw it. But I feel like it gets a little messy during the Skyfall section and it just kind of drags down the energy for me. So you just kind of want them to get to the fireworks factory to borrow your term. Or maybe they just need to somehow work that in a little more organically than feeling like a almost like a fourth act or something. Okay. No, I, I, I've seen that criticism online before. It's not the first time I've read it. I, I, I find it to be a fun diversion in the film. I think you've had all this massive action chase through London and the, sort of the underground and the briefing hall. And then you get a moment to sort of reflect and they travel up and you hear a little bit about his upbringing and you get to be with Kincaid, which is the best thing in this film. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Albert Finney, you know, MVP. Absolutely. Born Ultimatum, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Great guy. Wasn't he Bourne's dad? Uh, No, he was the head of the Treadstone, yeah. I think. You're right. He, he was like the guy who programmed Bourne, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Less good than that one. But no, I, I like hanging out with this. I know what you mean, though. Like, there's there's bits included with, like, hey, go through this little nook to get to the moors. And then there's, like, stuff on the ice. It's just going through the motions to get Bond to the church so you can have the final showdown with Silver. Do we need it? Maybe not. Could we bring this film to two hours? Maybe. It's not even, like, to me, a length thing. I feel like the pace lags a little bit in the back half. And, um, you know, it's just like it could have been refined a little more, but I guess at the same time, I can't really criticize it too much because I've never seen it in a Bond film before. I've never seen a Straw Dogs homage, and we may never get it again, but it makes it interesting to have it happen this once. Did, did it bump at you at all, Catherine? I think I agree with you, Cam, actually. In any other film, if it wasn't a Bond film, with everything being thrown at it, that end section would be a huge finale, a major set piece. But within the context of this film, I agree, Cam, I think it slows a little. I think the pacing just gets a little bit languid before it needs to be languid for that for the church scene and the the, the deep emotion of the later parts. Maybe the movie, at least in my eyes, is best when um, Silva's in control. When he's the one that is kind of calling the shots and driving the movie, even if it's, you know, not on screen because he doesn't show up till like, I think an hour 10 into the movie, but he's very much driving what's going on. And it feels like he's just kind of playing catch up when you get to that end section, because he doesn't know they're going to go to Skyfall and he's just kind of making it up on the spot. Yeah. Perfectly fair point. Now I, for my, I have a couple of dislikes, a couple of little ones, but I want to give a receipt to cams because you said, that you could forgive the ludicrous nature of Silver's plan. <laughs> it does bump me almost every time I watch this film. Just the amount of convenience involved for him to have any success of getting to M. I mean, the fact that Bond was standing in the right place and the train was on time, that it was going to hit Bond, I think is is insane. I think if you go back even further, 
the fact that Bond had to be hit with that bullet so he could connect that bullet to the guy, to connect that guy to Severin, all the way around, <laughs> just to get M in the right position so he could take M out. Mm-hmm. It, it feels like maybe that needed a little bit of a brush up, despite having three years of gestation. <sighs> okay, so like, I definitely have a response to this one, which is that like, you're right. You're not wrong at all. Like, Thank I you. agree. Like, oh. the, the villain plot gets very outlandish. And yet you look at the history of Bond villain plots, and they're all crazy. But I think this one, by maybe, like, trying for this sort of quasi-realism, invites those issues more than whatever. You know, Drax's plan in Moonraker. I was thinking of Drax's plan in my head just there. I was going to take the mickey out of Drax. <laughs> um, I, don't think, I don't think any of us are going up on that spaceship. No, and there's a lot of, you know, the Diamonds Are Forever plot is insane. A lot of the villain plots are, but maybe it's because they made this Craig era somewhat grounded and grittier. It just jumps out that little bit more. You can't steep the Bond era in realism and then continue with the same superfluous level of pantomime villains without it looking incongruous. I I couldn't have said it better. Uh, Perfect there. And then my other thing I wanted to bring up is Sort of a whiplash, again, sort of feeding off of that two serious films and then perhaps a bit more campy with its plot, is just how fast Daniel Craig has become a a grizzled vet. (laughs) Yeah. He's like, I I never left M, walks away, quantum basalis ends, and then at the end, he's like, this film is, oh, I'm so tired. (laughs) They're like, you're too old. You are a broken wreck. (laughs) (laughs) He can't even lift his arm to shoot a gun anymore. It, it's nice to know there's a bond that represents me in the morning, which is Daniel <laughs> Craig. <laughs> I I do wonder if elements like that would have worked way better if this was like Craig's fourth movie, fourth or fifth. Mm-hmm. You know, the whole idea of the agent who's past his prime. It is weird to have two movies. And those two movies, of course, are like taking place mere hours after the other like quantum picks up incredibly shortly after casino royale so you get the two film origin story followed by you're so old (laughs) (laughs) Uh, and and this film has a bit of an obsession with age especially with like trying to age out uh, judy dench's m as well and she's been like forcibly retired and also it's also weird that they chose to go down this route of saying how old and, and fragile bond is because his sort of fallibility is dropped by about the midway point. He's not able to shoot the targets in the, in the thing, but by the end, he's he is fit fighting duty, walking around Skyfall, taking on all the enemies. It, it's weird that that sort of... I, I know he takes the bullet out, and I know they mention it on the lift where he can't hold on properly, and he has to readjust his grip, and when he's shooting at Severin, he has to use the sideways grip that he uses earlier in the film. In the range, it does reference it there, but from that point onwards, he is... The fitted spry Daniel Craig that ran through a wall in Casino Royale. Partway through the film, he's asked what his hobby is, and Bond says resurrection, so I think this is just a bit of poetic license to allow him to rise from the ashes and be the Bond that we've always known he is. And I think there's also this commitment to this old ways can sometimes be the best approach like this theme carrying through the movie that they needed bond to be old for that reason or to be acknowledged as sort of not a young up-and-coming agent anymore what was the line uh, old dog new tricks yeah yeah <laughs> he's like i've already aged four years <laughs> well you can see that reflected with the you know casting of q with ben wishaw who's great and their big scene together um in the uh, art gallery and the whole point is to underline that bond is an outdated dinosaur again um maybe that's just a thing it, you know you look at we didn't comment that much on it but when um bond showed up in goldeneye pierce brosnan was what like 36 or something like that and they're like you're an old misogynist dinosaur and it's like he's a dinosaur at 36 oh my god what does that say about me <laughs> i've got a year to go until i officially become a dinosaur <laughs> Woo-hoo! that's right yeah yeah <laughs> We interrupt this program to bring you a special report. Calling all agents. Independent podcasting, much like the spy game, requires considerable resources. Whether it's research, equipment, hosting, or of course, constructing a top secret volcano lair, we're putting out the call for your support. That's right. As you may know, we've activated the Spy Hearts Patreon. 
home of our ever-growing lineup of Agents in the Field episodes where we decode non-spy films from your favorite spy actors and full film commentaries with more intel than a Basil Exposition briefing. Cam, what have we got in our crosshairs this month? Now's the time to catch up on our February programming with reviews of Laura Croft Tomb Raider, Rio Bravo, and The Deadpool. Did Clint close out Dirty Harry in style? We'll tell you. And if that sounds delicious, then become a true spy hard today and join the circus at patreon.com slash spyhards. But before this message self-destructs, Cam, resume the spy jinx. Um, other than that, I think I... I could chuck some some grenades at sort of the dodgy composite work at certain times in the film when when the motorbikes are driving over the rooftops. You know, you could see it's Daniel yeah. Craig in Pinewood probably with his face put onto someone else's. But that's just how films were at the time. I don't really throw shots at Sam Mendes for that one. I feel the same way about the Komodo dragons having the CG Komodo dragons, where I'm like, I get it, like. You can't work with Komodo dragons. You just can't. They are so... Is this, is this previous experience there, Cam? <laughs> I used to be a Komodo <laughs> wrangler in my previous life before I was a podcaster. Ka- Cam, Camodo. Do you know why Komodo dragons are so dangerous? No. Fair enough. Well, like, in the past, they thought Komodo dragons had, like, these bacteria-riddled mouths that when they bit you could make you very, very, very sick. And that was how they thought... They actually killed their prey. But the thing is, Komodo dragons, they've got razor sharp teeth and they actually do secrete an actual venom that inhibits motor function and can send someone into shock. So you don't really want to mess with that when you're dealing with actors on a set. Seems like it might be a bit of a headache. But seeing a CG one, having Bond jump off the back of a CG one, kind of reminding me a little bit of Live and Let Die. I love having those dragons there, but at the same time, it looks kind of goofy. You you clicked play on a Skyfall review. You did not think you'd get the uh, A to Z on Komodo dragons, but here it is. <laughs> I do like Bond pointing in horror and being like, "What the hell is that?" When you see it come out of the into the darkness. Yes, when he's been he's been lifted up by the bad guy, and it's 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 very Roger Moore that moment. Mm-hmm. It nice is nice to see. And also, this is the film we find out that Bond is a big fan of the Lion King because he walks out of that scene and says, Circle of Life. Oh. Oh, gosh. Good call. Good call. Mm. I could definitely see him being into Elton John. Should it have been Simba as opposed to Silva? Oh. Uh, yeah. Let's leave those puns where they are. Let's, yeah, let's, yeah. let's move on. Well, okay. <laughs> before we talk about the knock list, let's look at final notes that we have. I've got a couple. Catherine, is there anything you haven't mentioned that's in your notes you'd like to bring up? I think I think I just want to touch upon how wonderful the scene is with Q. We mentioned it earlier. I think it's got to be one of the finest bits of character writing for any character in the Bond film franchise ever. It's exquisite. The dynamic between them is just instantly comedic. But the fact that you get this sense of a depth of character to both of them Q isn't just talking about tea, he's talking about his Earl Grey. Bond is begrudgingly respectful of him by the end of that that first chat. Um and I just I think it's I think it's a lovely introduction to this idea of bringing something new into the Bond film franchise, but creating it so well that die-hard Bond fans instantly love it rather than thinking no no that's different we can't have different it's also a really nice age reversal on the classic Q that desmond llewellyn played where you had the older Q and the younger bond and here you get to reverse that and i think have a lot of fun with it it was a creative way to introduce Q that we'd never seen before works really well going forward and i love all their material here um i did have a couple notes actually about Q though they mentioned that uh at the end that Q is afraid of flying he obviously conquers that fear by the end of No Time to Die. Um, yeah, I saw that, but yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And the one bit I know a lot of people groan about, and I think we would be remiss not to mention, is um, Q plugging Silva's laptop into the MI6 headquarters. I know it drives people crazy. I, I feel like they thought they could get away with that moment because he mentions that he's built safeguards to protect them. So I guess it's just like Silva's that much better. But yeah. 
Yeah, I can hear people screaming, air-gapped computers, please. Um, yeah. But again, I think we're, we're trying to hold these films up to a, a lens that they shouldn't be looked at through, which is uh, realism. Yeah, it's Bond. Let it be ridiculous. Yes. I did just want to say about Q, I loved that scene too. And I loved just the use of the painting as a way of framing their conversation and you know, interpreting this painting. Bloody big ship. Uh, completely different. I, I just think that's a lovely way of bringing Q into the fold. It really is, yeah. And speaking of classic characters, one of the things I uh, wanted to mention as well is just an exit for Judy Dench. I think her death scene is incredibly effective. I think Craig plays it perfectly. And I, I think like some people you know, have quibbles with killing off Judy Dench. And I completely think that's valid if you didn't like that decision. I guess for me, the reason I was always a little more accepting of it and really liked it was that we never got finality on the M character ever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. like Bernard Lee passed away and we didn't really get a mention other than chief of staff filling in for one movie before we had Robert Brown take over. I mean, I don't know what the future of Bond holds, but if they go with full recasting everything, Ray Fiennes won't have gotten a finale to his character. So like the fact that they recognize the importance of Judy Dench's contributions and built like a, emotionally affecting scene about the passing of an M, I think is pretty significant. Again, the recontextualization of something that we know from Bond and we love from Bond, the little two-way quips between Bond and M in this scene is so poignant. 007, what took you so long? It's stunning. It makes me a little bummed that they brought back that little snippet of her in Spectre, because I'm like, this is the moment. Like, walk away and leave it all on the field in Skyfall. And, Scott, you and I saw the same thing happen with Nimoy in Star Trek 2009 and then coming back with a video screen moment in the follow-up to that film. It's like, walk away, people. Walk away. No one to walk away. Why are we we're doing two red alerts in one episode, aren't we? That's not good news. Well, I guess so. I will just say, though, that that was fixed in Star Trek Beyond because you get that lovely moment with the picture. That's true. That's true. Um, something else I noted was just the character of Patrice. We haven't really mentioned him, played by Ola Rapace, who typical, you know, villain character that Bond has to pursue at a certain point just to get to the next stepping stone. But the physicality of the actor doing, you know, the train fight with Craig is incredible. Um, and that fight in front of the screens in, um, in Shanghai is one of the most beautiful action sequences in the history of Bond. I'd never seen anything like it when I saw this movie. And I've you know mentioned throughout this review several things you can spot that feel like they've take, been taken from other popular blockbusters of the time. I've never seen anything like this fight sequence in front of the screens. And to me, there's more big bombastic action in the Craig era. But this particular fight scene really looms over a lot of the era for me. It's one that always ends up in the montages. Yeah. It's definitely a very uh, visually arresting moment that they will always go back to and say, look what the Craig films did. This lovely scene. And I completely agree. It is lovely. I, for my two notes, I had two left. One, we haven't said much about Adele. Mm -hmm. And I think, obviously, you know, we spoke about the awards she got and we, I think we've all sort of commented on the song being very good, but it is fantastic. It's, I don't know if it's Craig's best. I, I still have a soft spot for Chris Cornell, personally speaking. But of all the songs out there, this is still the one that gets the most radio play, at least I notice in the UK. And it's one that I think transcends being a quote-unquote Bond song and becomes a good song that plays on the radio. I think uh, um, not many. Goldeneye gets some love, I'd say. All the Time in the World gets played quite a bit. But it's 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 in those sort of ones that are sort of broken out of the of the... Bubble. I would say like View to a Kill, Nobody Does It Better. Um and I and I tend to hear nowadays Free Your Eyes only a lot for some reason. Is it just because you have it on the loop on your Spotify? That too, <laughs> yes. Mm. Um and my other note was and it's more of a question that I'll throw out to everyone. We've seen a bit a few Bond films by this point do some nostalgia on a Majesty Secret Service as a bit of nostalgia. Uh, Dying Her Day does some nostalgia. This is the 50th anniversary. Is this nostalgia in a Bond film done right? Yes, I think so. It's holding nostalgia in reverence. 
rather than seeing it as something to be glossed over or to be replaced. It's giving it the gravitas it deserves and something that I think really unites Bond fans is just the love of the old stuff. I think it does it as well without, I don't want to say overdoing it. But you think of what happens in Die Another Day where they just throw it all at you in like the space of 10 seconds. And say, hey, look at all these things. <laughs> you, remember that? Remember the shoe? Look, he's holding the shoe. It's subtle. The car is there. He's wearing the same coloured suit as Sean Connery. It, there's there's subtle nods, and I think this is where I think I, not necessarily overtly works, but subtly like it works in your head, and you feel connected to it through these subtle nods. Well, it feels like organic to the story they're telling. There's very few of these homages where they are stopping the movie dead to kind of point and be like, "Look, look, you remember that?" Because you can, you know, we mentioned the Komodo dragon sequence. You can say, "Well, that's live and let die," but it's not like the movie stops dead to you know, Sheriff Pepper does not pop up or you don't suddenly hear the score kick in from Live and Let Die in that moment. It's all there, but it works within the context of what Skyfall is. The only thing I think you can point to where it's like, I think Mendes was very classy in the making of this movie. Um, but I think the one moment he could not help himself was the DB5. And so I understand anyone who's like, that's a little bit far when you're getting the eject button, um, you know, callbacks and whatever. But I just think you know what? I'm willing to forgive this guy because the choices are so consistently well baked into the movie throughout. If he wants his one geek out moment, go nuts, Mr. Mendes. What I love about the Aston as well is that Bond has an Aston that's clearly been made for a for a Bond or a previous Bond, however you see the universe. It's got the ejector button. It's been specially made. He hasn't just gone to the local Aston dealership and picked one up. He's got one specifically that's designed with all of these gadgets in mind. But it's not a company car. Yeah. And it's something that he's owned privately. So he's just got it because <laughs> he thinks it's fun and he likes it when it's got all the buttons. I, I, I'd love to think there's a universe where uh, maybe his Bond, Daniel Craig's Bond, or whoever version of Bond brought this car... Uh, came back from a mission and said, oh, it's a total write-off. You don't want it back. Just just do the form, get rid of it. And he's like, I'm going to keep this car and put it in a shed. Was that Kincaid's old car? He seems the type. Yeah, yeah. Are you saying Kincaid was a spy? He seemed pretty comfortable shooting guys down with a shotgun. And he did uh, He did also do the, uh, the favorite line from this film about the always being the best and throw the knife down. Mm-hmm. 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 Prequel? Uh, <laughs> The, the King K Chronicles. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> write it. Someone write it and uh, and and cast uh, and cast Catherine as Money Penny. Yes, please. Oh, yeah, please. yeah. Please, I'd be so good at it. You could put me as someone that gets shot. I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be the Komodo dragon. <laughs> we'll CG you in. <laughs> <laughs> they should have done like practical animatronic Komodo dragons, right? No. You don't think mm. so? Okay. No, I, I think it would just look. It might work, but the money it would take to build that, I'd rather they just do a, a passable... C- it's cheaper to build animatronic than it is CG. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I would have gone with the blend like Jurassic Park. I, I'm sure they were like, we have X number of days to shoot this sequence. We're not spending two months building Komodo dragons to please Cam, but nonetheless. I want to see a re-edit of that scene where every time they cut back to a little Komodo dragon, uh, it's it's just this hastily made sort of cardboard blue tack paper mache creation with a, with a badge saying for cam <laughs> a voice going Roar. <laughs> I, I want it in the style of uh, roger moore and the snake in live and let die where it's clearly just a bit of rubber that he's wrestling in the water mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm. Now, yes. that's how i'd like my komodo dragons thank you i had a final question i guess for you guys which was just what are your thoughts on the thomas newman score Because Bond scores are so important over the many eras. Does this one jump out to you? Or is it a little more, I hesitate to say wallpaper, but a little more uh, easy to maybe overlook? I'd say it jumps out. In key moments, it's not overblown. It's nuanced in the way that this film can be. The helicopter shots when you're flying over Shanghai... The music that goes with that scene, the introduction of that location, you get such a great sense of space 
location grandeur from that musical cue. Also in the in the opening sequence on the on the train, um, when Bond I think it's when Bond jumps jumps onto the train the first time. Um, you hear the Bond light motif, and I think he, he gets it in early. And I think that's a lovely thing to do to just anchor the sort of safety net, I suppose, of the the Bond bingo that fans will be playing. I just wrote down it's unremarkable. It didn't really do anything for me. I had to say. I I I'm not the biggest. I mean, I you know, trained musician. I I care about music, and I like what David Arnold does in most of his films. I like what John Barry does in most of his films. I, I like what Michael Kamen did in his one too. Nothing about this one or the next one, which is Thomas Newman again, really jumps out to me. When I play, if I ever play these soundtracks, I don't think I can name you a track or mm. I could hum a tune from any particular scene. But that doesn't mean it's Eric Serra levels of wanting to pierce my ears with a pencil. Sure. It's just, it's there. Which is sometimes the best way to be. Just exist and don't overtake the scene. Yeah, I've always been a little mixed on it. I think it's stronger in the first half of the movie. I think a lot of the music he creates when you're introducing Bond to new environments is really cool. The Macau stuff is really fantastic. I find by the back half, it kind of like turns into like a Hans Zimmer kind of ripping thing. And it just feels, I don't know, it just doesn't kind of pop the way I find some of the other Bond artists do. I do remember at the time feeling a little bummed for David Arnold because I just think David Arnold, it wasn't a case of a composer who was running out of ideas. His work in Quantum and Casino was so fantastic Mm -hmm. that I was annoyed not to see him get to continue that journey. Yeah, which I I think is another conversation for another day of how they drop a lot of threads from Quantum and, and, and Casino leading into this. I think that's maybe something we could dissect when we get to Spectre, which really messes with the continuity of Daniel Craig. But you're all here to find out if Skyfall makes the knock list. That is the question that we are going to answer now. And Cam, as Scott, we need to just mention this movie has a knock list. We've been criticized for uh, never tackling a Mission Impossible movie, which have the knock list. But this movie, Silva has a knock list and he's releasing it. It took us two years to have an official knock list. We're relevant. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Finally, we got there. Congratulations. Yeah. Um, but. Cam, as we do have a guest joining us, could you just run us through what the knock list is? Yes, the knock list is our tortured acronym for need to see official classics of the Spy Hards canon. We are basically at the end of every episode, you know, we talk about it, we break it all down, but we decide if it belongs on the list of the all-time great spy films. So some Bond films that have made the knock list before, you've got Goldfinger, Thunderball in a somewhat contentious vote, uh, Dr. No One from Russia with Love made it on, Goldeneye. And Casino Royale made it on, but Quantum did not. So we'll have three votes this week. Catherine, you'll go first. Yes or no, is Skyfall going onto the list of the best spy movies ever made? Yes, because it summarizes Bond to those who don't know him, to those who don't understand his legacy. So if only as a timepiece, a sort of time capsule for what Bond means to an audience of that era, and how different generations of Bond fans can unite within one film that addresses old and new. I think this deserves a spot. Yeah, I can't argue with that. And it's something something we haven't really spoken about, but if people are asking what's a Bond film I should introduce people to, this is often one I will cite. It really has like all of the hallmarks. It doesn't go too far in any particular direction like License to Kill does or anything like that. It's, it's, It's in the pocket. It's also um, very like free of continuity issues or what have mm-hmm. you that might bog down someone else. Like They considered bringing Quantum back, I think, very early on in the process. Barbara Broccoli had mentioned that, yeah, we're going to continue on, I think, with Quantum Elements. I think they were smart to kind of build as they wanted a Goldfinger, which really does stand alone. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's one yes. Cam, you're up. What do you have to say? Well, I mean, I said this movie was kind of the definitive Bond film of its decade, so it'd be pretty ridiculous of me not to say yes to the definitive Bond film of its decade. I think this movie is incredibly important to Bond canon. I think it's a fantastic movie. In terms of like Bond as blockbuster experience, it's probably the best example in the modern era. Um, I Even in the Brosnans, I love a lot of the Brosnans, but I don't know that they ever had kind of the the high hits that this movie has. This really is working at the highest possible level of blockbuster filmmaking and, uh, and just pulls it off. So like 
so sleekly. And I think one thing that maybe we haven't addressed is like the legacy aspect. This is the 50th anniversary movie. This movie is both paying tribute to the Bond films that came, you know, that before it, but for a whole other generation, the Craig era is going to be their entry point for this series. And this movie is introducing elements that are going to help educate them going forward in the future of Bond movies. Because I don't expect every 12-year-old to be sitting and digging up copies of Diamonds Are Forever. There's going to be a lot of those old movies that they just can't connect with. And I think a movie like this is very important in terms of getting across the iconography, things like the DB5, that they're probably going to recognize in the future of the franchise and that matter. I, I can't fault that argument either. I think it's... It's pretty perfect. I mean, that means it's two yeses. My vote means absolutely nothing, which is usually how it goes. But I'll say it anyway. It's a yes from me because it's got Kincaid in it. <laughs> <laughs> but there you go, folks. That's three yeses. Skyfall is absolutely making the knock list. Was it any question? I don't know. Probably not. But I'm glad it's there. But the dossier on the film is complete and filed as classified. Catherine. I want to thank you, firstly, for joining us on this journey on the DB5 up to Scotland to talk about Skyfall. Uh, it's been wonderful to speak with you. It's been a pleasure. I've loved dissecting such an interesting film. And, you know, much as we were dealing with Skyfall, things are really going up with you. I, didn't, I did sort of mention it at the start and called you, you know, you talked about your documentary there. But to dig into it a little bit, you are working on a documentary at the moment. It's called Women at 36,000 Feet. Uh, and your production company is putting it together. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. This is a production from my production company, Flight Path Productions. So named because I wanted the first feature documentary that I make to be aviation related. I've spent the last couple of years reaching out and interviewing hundreds of female pilots all around the world about their experiences working in a fantastic male-dominated STEM industry and what they have done to literally fly over the glass ceiling and create new opportunities for women and girls for generations to come. It's been an absolutely fascinating experience. And you've, you've crowdsourced the funding for this as well. We've contributed to that. How is the production going at the moment? It's going very well. We've been filming in Dublin and in London, and we're hoping this year to fly out to the US to go to several locations and also a small tour of South Africa. There are a lot of burgeoning aviation opportunities out there that don't often get the screen time that they deserve, and we are there to change that. Do you have like a rough idea as to when you would hope to have it out? We're hoping to release sometime next year. We'll be completing filming this year and going into the edit probably at the end of this year towards the start of next year. Awesome. And if people want to hear more, we'll have a link in the show notes below. But, you know, just tell us, where can people find out more about the documentary? The best place to go is flightpathproductions.com. That is where everything lives, including links to all of our socials. You can also come follow me at Catherine Vinclair on most platforms because I'm often posting about that production as much as Bond, as much as voiceover. And we'll be doing a little post at some point this week about it too, so you can look out for that if you don't find it in the show notes below. But a wonderful cause, and I suggest supporting it because I love flying, because it's the reason I met Cam. Flying is very important, and getting around <laughs> and seeing the world is very important too. That's why I don't like flying, is because I met Scott that way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Cam. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> um, but Catherine, it's been a wonderful pleasure having you on the show. You are now officially our Miss Moneypenny. Oh, thank you so much. That means the world. And, um, well, they say the world is not enough, but <laughs> it, I would definitely recommend checking you out on social media. There'll be links in the show notes below. But Catherine, thank you once again. Thank you, agents. It's been a pleasure. Well, there you go, folks. That was our chat with the wonderful Catherine Vinclair. Thank you once again for joining us. I hope you enjoyed that. Cam, the question goes to you, sir. What are we following up Skyfall with? Yes, Scott, as you mentioned earlier in the episode, this Friday we are going to talk to Nicholas Woodison, the distinguished actor from Stage and Screen, who obviously played Dr. Hall in Skyfall. But we're also going to talk to him about some really memorable spy work he did in movies like The Russia House, The Man Who Knew Too Little, even The Pelican Brief. So there's a whole bunch there, and I think you're really going to enjoy it. Yeah, absolutely. Check that out on Friday. And I think 
I teased it earlier. We have another interview next week, Cam. And I think I'm going to take the glory for introducing this one, if you don't mind. Go for it. Well, we spoke about the reception to Skyfall. It's still the biggest earning James Bond film of all time. Practically nuclear, you could say. And speaking of nuclear, we thought we'd call in James Bond's resident nuclear physicist. Yes, you've heard that right. Denise Richards, Dr. Christmas Jones, is joining us next week on the show. It's a fantastic discussion. We cannot wait to share it with you all. Surprise! I think you guys are going to have an absolute blast with this one. Was that a pun about nuclear bombs? (laughs) Yes, it was. All intended. Yep, so make sure you hit that subscribe button and stay tuned for more. Uh, If you like what you heard on the show, please consider leaving us a five-star review wherever you get your podcasts. And do not forget to follow us discreetly, of course, on social media at SpyHards. That's S-P-Y-H-A-R-D-S on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. But this week, folks, I'll leave you with a poem. We are not now that strength which in old days moved earth and heaven. That which we are, we are. One equal temper of heroic hearts, made weak by time and fate, but strong in will to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield.